Okay, we are now live, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Micah. Hi, everyone. My name is Micah Standing Soldier. I am one of the law clerks for the Legal Rights Center. Uh, we're just going to be doing sort of an informal Q&A today. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, just drop them and we will get them answered. Um, so I guess, uh, Josh, do you want to introduce yourself and sort of just kind of, if you could start off with you know, some of the most important stuff that's happened in the last week in the trial, a lot has, has gone down. So it's kind of hard to, to get it in a couple of quick sentences, but. I'll see what I can do. Hi everyone, I'm Josh Esme. I'm one of the attorneys at the Legal Rights Center and I have been trying to keep tabs on the trial as much as possible while also doing my other work um, so that I can help you guys. Um, so yeah, the trial the last week um, has been interesting. Um, I think sort of what we've seen from the state kind of their, I think their strategy is let's just be real, real thorough um, and, and you know, kind of just try to impress the, the jury almost with how much has gone into this investigation, how many people they've talked to um, and really sort of how universal it is from everybody involved, uh, whether it's the bystanders uh, on the street who were right there, but then all of the investigators who, who followed up basically just you know, everybody involved uh, from the, the immediate witnesses to the investigation is just all concluding that this is really problematic um, criminal behavior. And, and really, that's what's going to be kind of the core of the conflict between the two parties, right, is you know, no one's disputing really that there's that there was this use of force. It's this question of was the use of force reasonable uh, under the you know, the objectively reasonable officer standard um, that comes to us from Graham v. Connor, the U.S. Supreme Court case that we talked about last time, um, and that has been incorporated in state law and MPD uh, policy. And so kind of from the state's perspective, it's uh, let's take this opportunity to present all of these people, show this sort of unified front, um, impress the jury with how exhaustive our, our um, investigation and our presentation is, and then also have that be an opportunity um, to, you know, really drill their message home by repetition. So we've seen, like, for example, they took the, the opportunity to play the video every single time there was an opportunity to play the video, which I think is sort of a strategy of let's just, like, really hammer this home. Repetition is powerful. It's how we get uh, um, it's how we get our messages to stick in our in our audience's head, um, and I think you know largely that's a good strategy. Um, from the defense, what we've seen, you know, the, the defense at this point in, in the trial is, it, in some ways, almost kind of I don't know if disadvantage is the right word, but this isn't really the defense's time uh, of the of, of the tr of kind of to shine for the trial, right? That they've got to wait until the state has presented their own their whole case before the defense can start calling witnesses. So really, Eric Nelson, the defense attorney sort of limited to what he can do on cross examination, which, you know, one of the things that we've seen is that almost every witness that the state has presented is really sort of firm in their opinion um, that this was a crime and that this was wrong. So it's not like there have been very many sort of neutral witnesses that uh, that might be uh, you know, might be sort of more cooperative with the defense. Um, so really sort of what we see from the defense is, you know, just identify some facts and some themes that you are fairly confident that you can get uh, the witnesses to, to talk about, um, get those facts in the record so that you can use them later on down the line when your witnesses um, are able to take the stand. And so I, th I think we see that particularly again with, uh, with the competing views of whether uh, Chauvin's use of force was objectively reasonable and what, sort of what we've seen is Nelson try to you know cherry pick these facts that he's going to be able to use when he has his expert come on who's going to disagree so we have gotten to the point where we started to see um, some uh, expert witnesses from the state um, uh, that have been able to give an opinion about whether the use of force was reasonable or authorized or consistent with MPD policy. Chief Arredondo, who testified yesterday, is sort of a good example of that. And again, the state's witnesses have all said, no, this wasn't reasonable. It wasn't in line with our policy. It was not justified. Therefore, it was a crime. Um, 
And what you see from the defense is, okay, well, I know I'm not going to get them to give a different opinion, but I can try to get them to say things like, you know, talk, we've seen him come back and, and talk about, you know, how scary the crowd can be, for example, or he's repeatedly asked questions about, you know, situations can change. Someone can go from being compliant one second to non-compliant another second. Um, things like that. I, I think he, he was uh, able to get Chief Arredondo uh, to agree that the knee was more on the shoulder and less on the neck. Um, so like those types of things, which I anticipate that they will try to argue at, at some point to show that the use of force is, is reasonable. Um, and then we've seen the state always gets their chance to redirect after that cross-examination and the state will do, do their best uh, to get the witnesses to clarify that, to sort of anticipate what those arguments are going to be and undercut them. Um, and so they'll keep coming back to, uh, you need to de-escalate things like, uh, you know, even if there was, uh, you know, uh, some use of force that was authorized early, uh, in an encounter that once the person is subdued, once they're calm again, then you need to de-escalate. We've seen uh, them ask a number of witnesses about, you know, aren't you supposed to uh, change the position of the person's body from on their back to on their side? And the witnesses have all sort of consistently said that, yes, you do, because it's higher risk that it's going to affect your breathing if, uh, if you remain in that prone position. Um, on the ground, you're supposed to be on your side or sitting up. Um, and then we have, we did start to get a few medical witnesses, um, the EMT people and the doctor, Dr. Langford, um, who pronounced Floyd dead. None of these, though, I think are really the expert medical witnesses. Um, sort of the issue that, that we talked about in our past sessions that I think is going to be core to the, the two parties um, argument with respect to the medical evidence is going to be this issue of causation. Um, and can the state prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was Chauvin's actions and not something else, the state or the defense is going to argue the drug use, um, that was the, the actual cause of, of um, George Floyd's death. Um, and even though we've gotten some medical witnesses so far, there are really more medical witnesses that are just there to describe and, and, and again, that sort of exhaustive detail, everything that happened and weren't really there to give opinions on that causation factor. So Dr. Langford did, you know, he was the doctor that pronounced Floyd dead, uh, but he didn't give an opinion on cause of death really. Um, and in fact, you, you know, one of the things that, uh, Eric Nelson, the defense attorney, made sure to sort of highlight on cross-examination is that he didn't even have all the information. No one had told him about the drug use, for example, um, at that time. Um, so yeah, I'm sure I'm missing a lot, but that's sort of my overview of, of what I've seen and what has uh, stuck out to me. Maybe, um, Micah, we can just uh, jump in and, and go with questions. That's why we're here, right? Yeah, absolutely. So for those watching, if you have any questions you would like answered, um, go ahead and type that into the Facebook chat and we will get those answered for you. Um, so one of the things that you'd said is uh, that hammering home, rewatching this video over and over and over again, you know, repetition is power. Um, I was wondering, how does that affect the jury members? Are they offered support, you know, before or after the trial, you know, during or after the trial, you know, having to see this video over and over again, that can be, you know, that can be traumatizing. Um, no, I don't think they are offered support. Um, frankly, um, there might be something that is done after the fact. Um, but I don't think it's, that it's not something that I, you know, the government or the court system, um, organizing. Um, and in fact, I think it probably would be somewhat problematic to offer them support in the middle of the trial um, without one side um, or the other becoming concerned that that's interfering with uh, the opinions that they're forming and what they're what they're seeing. Um, it's not an easy job being a juror. Okay, thank you. Um, so what are your thoughts about how the live streaming in you know this it's kind of new to have a, a trial of this magnitude live streamed for everyone to see. Um, do you think that's changing the case and illuminating racism in the criminal justice process? Um, 
that's interesting. I'm going to work backwards. I think that there's no way that it, uh, I'll say this, let me re rephrase. I, th I definitely think it is illuminating the racism in the criminal justice system. I, I mean, I, I think that is, the racism in the criminal justice system is so pervasive and so obvious that, you know, to the extent that it needs illuminating, it's because people just aren't aware of what's happening in the criminal justice system at all. Um, so, you know, I do think just shining this spotlight on it, uh, you know, shows what it is. And, you know, and the, just the basic facts of this case are, the, you know, the, the racial implications are just absolutely inescapable. Um, I think, you know, I've uh, seen the defense get a lot of criticism for playing into racial stereotypes and tropes, and I have I, I think they are, um, you know, some of the, the lines of argument about, you know, how scary this crowd is and how the officers, you know, the sort of the implication is that they had to use this much force because um, Chauvin is, is large and large and black and because they're in a, you know, a neighborhood with a lot of people of color, um, with a crowd of people of color. Um, I think all of that, you know, has a very obvious racial underpinning to it. And I think that it is designed to play upon, um, you know, I think the defense is hoping that there are people in the jury that uh, that, that kind of messaging really resonates with. Um, I've seen, you know, a lot of people have, uh, you know, just in my like friends and family network have really been um, sort of asking me questions and sort of really been appalled by this line of argument. Um, and it, I was appalled by this line of argument too, that um, uh, that it's somehow the crowd's fault, right? That if the crowd had not been there um, or had just sort of more, you know, more peacefully, although they weren't even, they were peaceful. <laughs> like the, the worst thing that they were doing is calling them a bum, right? But if they had been sort of more compliant, more peaceful, more not whatever they were, that then that would not have interfered with the officer's ability to, to do their standard of care and, and care for Chauvin. That was one of the things that Nelson said in his open, opening argument. And I, I found that line of argument really troubling. On the other hand, <laughs> Eric Nelson's job is to be an absolute zealot advocate for his client. It is his duty to make any argument that he thinks helps his client have a chance to win. And if he wasn't doing it, he, he wouldn't be doing his job and he'd be the wrong, the wrong person to, to represent Derek Chauvin. And I think that that line of argument absolutely could play with, you know, that, um, you know, that person who's been spending all summer listening to Fox news talk about how, the cops aren't the problem. Antifa is the problem, um, right? Uh, so, you know, there's that like culture war that is that exists in our politics writ large, and that has race as an underpinning of it is absolutely a theme here. And you know, if Nelson can uh, convince a couple of juries that are susceptible to that propaganda. <laughs> Uh, this is what I'd call it. Um, that could be a strategy that helps them win. Um, so, I don't know. I, I might have gone off track a little bit there, but I hope well, that answers. That was, the a, that was a hard question to answer. Uh, looks like we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, what happens if there isn't a unanimous decision by the jury? Yeah. So, the first thing that happens is Judge Cahill says, "Go back and keep deliberating." I don't want to do this again. Um, so the, the, basically, uh, you have to have a unanimous decision one way or the other. Um, and if you don't, then it's what's called a hung jury. Um, and a hung jury leads to what's called a mistrial, which means the whole thing was for not, and the state has to decide, basically the trial gets tossed out and the state decides if we try again with a new jury. Um, everybody hates to have that happen, obviously. Well, the defense doesn't always mind, you know, a, a hung jury is, 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 a, is a win from the defense because you avoided a conviction here in this trial. You might not even have another trial, but even if you do have another trial, you get to take all the lessons that you learned from this trial and all of the testimony that's on record from this trial um, to 
to prepare for the next one. So usually, uh, yeah, usually the defense is celebrating if there is a mistrial. Um, but certainly the state doesn't want that and the judge doesn't want that. And so you'll, usually you'll see a judge really, you know, try to encourage the, the jury to keep going, keep deliberating, um, get to a unanimous, unanimous decision if at all possible. But at some point, if, you know, the jury keeps saying it's never going to happen, it's never going to happen, the judge has no choice but to call it a mistrial. Do you think in that instance that the state would retry the case? I have no idea. Um, I guess if I if I had to had to bet, I'd probably say they would. Um, just because I there's you know there's so much attention on this, and because the you know in some of the other police killings that we've seen here in Minnesota and across the country, you often get uh, the police themselves doing a lot of PR work right at the front of it. Um, you'll see news stories where they'll focus on the deceased's criminal record and sort of imply uh, quite heavily that we shouldn't, we shouldn't care too much that this person is, is dead, they were a criminal. Um, that, you know, and, and then you'll see, you know, police union people defending the officer's conduct, and you'll see all of this happening in the press. Um, and, and not, not just from the like, partisan sides, right, not just from Tucker Carlson, uh, but from like the police themselves, from the union themselves, the chief themselves. And in this one, I don't, I remember thinking, oh, there's just, they're not defending him at all. Like ev everyone is ready to um, call this one a crime um, because the video was, you know, it's just the time that he's on his neck with Mr. With George Floyd being unresponsive. I mean, it really, um, really stood out um, in a way that just, did, you know, there, there was no immediate way to, to justify it. Um, and so, so that was is sort of has made me think that from the beginning this one felt different, which is why I think there's more, they're more likely that they would try again. Whereas in other cases, um, you know, it's almost felt like the prosecutors were looking for reasons not to try. Um, we've seen a bunch of prosecutors use grand juries, for example, um, to, in my opinion, deflect from making a charging decision and let let the grand jury say, oh, we're not going to charge. Um, and none of that happened here, right? It was, you know, it was, they were going to, they were going to bring this case against um, Chauvin from, from the moment that video went viral. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, will the Chauvin trial impact the trials, if they even occur, of the other uh, fired policemen? I think so. Um, I think that the state would probably have to think long and hard about whether they're gonna go forward with those trials if Chauvin is acquitted. Um, now they can't, they absolutely can. And the, um, you know, the charges are different. Um, and, you know, one one jury, so one of the things that I, I think you need is sort of somewhat overlooked from, by, by people who, don't live in the in the the criminal system like we do. Um, is that when a defendant is acquitted at trial, it does not mean they're innocent. Uh, well, let, let me rephrase. It does mean they're innocent because, as a matter of law, you're innocent unless you're proven guilty. But it does not mean that the defense has proven their innocence, right? That the jury has decided, oh, I'm convinced this person is innocent. It means that the jury has decided that the state couldn't meet their burden of proving the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so this is a way over simplistic way of, of explaining it. And, and we'd never get away with describing reasonable doubt this way to an actual jury, but reasonable doubt is the like highest legal standard that we have. So think of it as being like, you know, 95% sure, 99% sure that the crime was committed, right? Um, we have other legal standards that apply in, in civil proceedings or no, other non-criminal proceedings that are a lot lower than that. 
Um, and, you know, so if the jury comes back and is like, well, we're 60% sure that he did it. Well, that's, you know, that's still being sure that it was that he did it. And it would, it would be enough to win the day in a civil trial, uh, but it's not enough to win the day in a criminal trial. Um, so that's why the state could sort of, you know, consistently um, go forward with the trials against the other officers. But, you know, I think the gap in the culpability between Chauvin and the other officers is so big that if, um, you know, if Chauvin was, was to walk, I think that, you know, that the state might not go forward with the other ones. Thank you. Uh, another question from Facebook. Uh, can the jury decide on a guilty verdict of a lesser charge? Uh, yes, but only the charges that the state has brought against Chauvin will go to the jury. Um, there is it, there, it, there is a possibility for the defense to make a motion to have a, a what's called a lesser included charge um, added, but I, I don't, that hasn't been something that it has seemed likely here. Um, but there are, you know, there are three charges. We've talked about them in some of our other um, broadcasts, which I think are all like, av like available to download. Am I right on that, Micah? Yep, they're on the website and they're on our Facebook as well. So, um, so if you want to hear me walk through what all the charges are, go find uh, one of those other videos. Um, but yeah, the jury could, for example, man manslaughter, um, third degree manslaughter is one of the three charges. It's the, the least um, serious charge in terms of the scope of punishment, the amount of punishment available if you were convicted of that. And certainly the jury could acquit or find Chauvin not guilty on the two murder charges, but just convict on manslaughter. That's definitely a possibility. Thank you. And for those, we have a couple of minutes left. So if you have any last minute questions you'd like to be answered, you can put them in the Facebook chat and we will get those answered. Um, one of the questions that we didn't get to last time, um, is there a strategy on the defense's part that Mr. Nelson shows up, you know, sort of on his own, is basically by himself? Do you think there's a strategy behind that? Well, there probably is a strategy behind it. Um, I think all that's thought out. And, um, you know, I, I suspect that Mr. Nelson does have other, uh, other attorneys supporting him. Um, he does work at a small firm with other, with other defense attorneys. Um, and, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think he, you know, he's basically has a contract with the police union and is on retainer, um, to represent officers in these type of situations. And I know he's not the only defense attorney with that. Um, so I, I think there probably are resources, um, whether the, you know, I don't know if it's a, a strategy in terms of like, they think it will play better with the jury that he's on his own. Um, I certainly think that could be the case. Um, um, but I, I'm not confident enough in that guess to say that's why it is. Um, it, it may very well just be that, you know, Mr. Nelson himself finds it easier um, to just be the, the one point person on, on everything. Um, I think, especially at this point in the trial where all the defense is really doing is, is crossing the witnesses. Um, and there's, you know, there's a fair amount of kind of similar witnesses. Um, I don't think, you know, that's just what the state, the state's part of the trial right now with the direct examination it makes more sense to me um, to have a team of attorneys because you can kind of divide up all of those witnesses and then all of the sort of prep time that goes into getting those witnesses ready to testify, meeting with them, going through what you're going to be talking about, um, you know, just coming up with your, your outline, your strategy of what the direct examination is going to be up about, what facts you want to hit, what order you want to hit them, how you want to ask the questions, all of that. That actually can be really uh, advantageous to have a team of attorneys that can just sort of divide up that pool of people. Um, and then it's like, um, you know, then you don't have to have one person responsible for, you know, these dozens of witnesses. Um, I think it's a little bit easier for the defense to prep the, the cross. I think it's going to be when it gets to the defense presenting their own, uh, their own witnesses, then that's sort of, that's the part where it may be 
it would be benefit Mr. Nelson to have, um, you know, have other people to help him uh, set up those those direct examinations. Um, but my guess is that the you know the defense's witness list is going to be shorter than the state's already. So it might just be he looked at it and said, "This is you know, I've got enough. I um, with with just me to do this." Um, oh, and then one more note. There's also, um, you know, this defense has this element of, um, you know, part of our job is to represent an individual person. Um, and so it can be harder sometimes when you have a team of people, um, then there's sort of multiple relationships and multiple kind of avenues of trust that need to be built up. Um, and so that might be another factor that's playing into it, right, is that Nelson and Chauvin have, you know, built up that attorney-client relationship. Chauvin trusts Nelson, um, and it, it, you know, it might just be one of those things where bringing in a third person would, you know, not make everybody comfortable. Thank you. Um, speaking of, you touched on witnesses a little bit. Um, can you address the issue of impeachment and sort of, you know, if a, if a witness is impeached, then what happens to all of the evidence that was presented during that, you know, the, that examination? Sure. Um, so the short answer is nothing happens to the evidence, right? Um, what happens when someone is impeached is that the hostile party, right? So the, the party cross-examining them, although actually, frankly, it can happen on direct examination too. It's, it's just more rare. Um, presents evidence that shows that something, uh, or well, presents evidence that if believed uh, shows that something that the witness said earlier under oath was incorrect. Um, so, so like, like, you know, your classic example or real simple example might be, you know, an eyewitness it testifies that the robber was wearing a red hat. Uh, and then the defense has a police report um, uh, or actually, yeah, so the, and the defense is able to present evidence, um, you know, maybe from a statement that that witness made to a police officer earlier that, uh, that, that the suspect was wearing a gray hat. Okay, so that's that's impeachment evidence. And now that witness has been impeached on that issue. The both both statements are now in evidence, and it just means that the jury has to sort of figure out what is true and what isn't true. And so bottom line is that all the impeachment evidence does is calls into question um, the the credibility of the witness's testimony. Like uh, if it's really key that this person is wearing, wearing a red hat, you know, can the jury really trust this eyewitness testimony that it was red when earlier they said it was gray? Thank you. Um, I guess one of the last sort of things we can touch on is uh, what we look forward to in, you know, the next couple of days and the next week. What can you expect? And if possible, do you do you have sort of a, an idea of what of who the defense might call for their, you know, their expert witnesses, you know, or their their chance to prove their side of the case? Um, I will admit that I haven't looked at the witness list closely to know names of people that the defense is going to call. Um, and I certainly also haven't like researched exactly who they are. Um, but, uh, you know, I just in general terms, the defense is going to present its own expert witnesses that are going to get to offer an opinion on some of these uh, key issues that differs from the expert witnesses that the state has, is presenting so far. Um, and maybe uh, just to back up a little bit to explain a little bit more what that means. Um, this designation expert witness is really important. And the reason it's important is that generally a witness is not allowed to give an opinion on a fact that the jury needs to find in order to make their decision, right? So um, none of the witnesses, the eyewitnesses, the bystanders who are not experts, for example, they are not allowed under the rules to testify uh, that they think that Chauvin's actions caused Floyd's death. Because that causation element is one of the things that the state needs to prove, one of the things that the jury needs to decide. And, uh, and so the witness's opinion on that doesn't matter. It's not relevant. Um, 
the what what the witness observed, the facts that that someone could form that opinion from, those are relevant. That's what the witnesses get to testify about. All right, but that's different for experts, and the reason it's different for experts is that sometimes in trials we get issues that are so outside of the scope of common experience that we wouldn't expect a, an, a lay person really to be able to form an opinion on that without help from somebody who's got all of the, you know, the years of training for an expert. Um, I think that's really clear that that's the case for things like, um, uh, you know, the medical evidence, issues of causation, that kind of thing, right? Um, and so we get doctors who are experts on that, who are able to give an opinion about whether Floyd's or Chauvin's actions caused George Floyd's death. Similarly, the other issue that, the ex that is key for the experts here is uh, that objectively, whether the use of force was objectively reasonable from the perspective of a police officer. The, the, um, the jurors don't have police officer training so we get to have an expert who has police officer training to get to offer an opinion on that. Um, I kind of think that uh, being able to judge whether use of force is objectively reasonable is something that's a lot more in the wheelhouse of your average person than the medical part is. Um, so I actually, you know, my defense attorney side kind of thinks that uh, sometimes cops get to be experts a little bit more easily than they should be um, and get to give opinions on things that I don't think you really need expert uh opinions for juries to decide but nevertheless that's the law it's really clear so we've got experts that are going to be able to testify on causation and on this uh was the use of force justified because it was objectively reasonable from the perspective of a police officer and all the states witnesses in their case of chiefs their expert witnesses are going to give opinions that favor the state's case they're going to say uh uh, there was causation here. Chauvin's actions did cause Floyd's death and it was not objectively reasonable. And so the big thing to come back finally and answer the question after five minutes of rambling, the big thing that we're going to see the defense be able to do when they call witnesses is they're going to have experts who offer the opposite opinion. And then it's just going to be the jury's job to figure out who's, uh, who's, um, experts they believe. And when that's sometimes you'll hear people throw around the term battle of the experts. Um, that's kind of what we get in these, uh, in these types of cases. Thank you, Josh, very much. Um, so we are anticipating that the state will likely rest on Friday and then the defense will have two to three days and then closing arguments might be as soon as next, the end of next week. Um, so we are going to be doing another Ask an Attorney session um, and a forum next week. But if you want to, you can all join us tomorrow at noon for our Youth Perspectives on Justice panel. We have a great uh, list of people that are going to be there. So hope to see you all there. And thank you, Josh, very much. Um, you can Pleasure. find the video on the Legal Rights Center website or on the Facebook page. So thank you very much. Thanks, Micah. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a good one.